This is Amateur Logic, episode 153, for February 15th, 2021. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com, and by ICOM, and a sweetheart of a package with the IC705. It's the perfect sidekick for hams that like to enjoy what both the great indoors and outdoors have to offer. Good evening. Welcome to another action-packed episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Neil. And I'm Mike. And we have a show lined up for you tonight. Notice I didn't say good show. That's that's because it's, be a, it's a it's great, be a great show. show. Yeah. There you go. That's what I was thinking. Well, this is February here, and sometimes the weather can get a little bit unpredictable well they're predicting at this time it's a cold wave coming across the whole country and we're right in the crosshairs to well it's been cold for a couple of days but to really get some ice and a lot of unwanted winter fun coming up here over the weekend thank you mike <laughs> oh thank you thank you skype for doing that Oh, uh, the the weather? No, no. Skype Skype changed my background for some reason. It tried to take over again. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Well. Um, well, he was he was blaming the cold weather down here on you sending it down. <laughs> I don't think they're calling it a pol polar vortex this time. I don't know where it's coming from, but uh, uh, as Tommy was saying to me uh, earlier in the week, um, it, it was it was hitting parts of Texas pretty hard too. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, we got the ice coming here. Um, Monday is a real good chance we'll all get pretty much coated with ice here. Yep. That's what it's looking like. And being in the broadcasting business, that's not a good thing. An ice storm is the last thing you want to see coming, you know. We can handle the snow. No big deal there. But you get a good layer of ice on an FM antenna. And you got some problems, or you get a good, you know, a good little hunk of ice between the arc gaps on an AM transmitter and or, or uh, the base of the antenna. Yeah. Yeah. The ice really isn't good for anybody, except, unless it's summertime and you're putting it in the cooler. Um, but other than that, I can't think of anything else that comes good from it. Yeah. If you're watching the live stream, we, we have a chat going on at the same time. You can join us at amateurlogic.tv forward slash chat. If you're watching the live stream, you're not in the chat room. You're only getting half the fun. But what's the deal, Emil? Hey, that was a rhyme. <laughs> what's the deal, Emil? Let's see. I guess the deal is wondering which half. Which half? That's up to you. So, so uh pretty good crowd over there and it's a lot of fun in the chat room so if you're watching this live jump on over there and join them well tommy what's been going on since the last episode what have you been up to i got a new uh new little device in i'm pretty excited about it the uh, little arduino competitor came out and i've uh, been playing around with that some so it's pretty got some promise um uh, price is right for a meal that should have perked your ears up it's cheap and uh, very capable. Yeah. It looks like Mike has got one of them there, but it doesn't look little to me. It's um, Yeah, he's leaning his head back on it. He got the larger, the jumbo version. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, George, you, you you hit it. You mentioned the uh, 
the winter weather is uh, coming, and some of it's already beyond and past us, and more is coming. But uh, me and Glenn, KG5C, in the chat room this uh, past uh, couple of weeks ins ago, went over and did uh, Winter Field Day for the uh, W5SLA Club down here. And uh, we we made a show out of it, a segment. So that's what we're up to. And not looking forward to the weather, but it is what it is. And we figured we'd go figure out how to operate within those conditions, even though I don't think our conditions are like some others. Yeah, you, it's a good thing Winter Field Day didn't fall this weekend for us. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have been better off if it did. I wanted to participate so bad this year, but... Uh, I had a work deal, over, worked all pretty much the whole weekend uh, over Winter Field Day weekend, so I kind of missed out on it. So I'll have to live through a meal this time. <laughs> okay, we all know how dangerous that can be. Mike, what, what's what been going on up there? Well, busy at work, but um, speaking of the weather and, and Winter Field Day and snow, it's too bad... Um, that uh, I didn't have more time because we have enough snow on the ground right now, at least two feet still. Um, wow. So it's been hanging around, and uh, with that much snow in the backyard, I could have easily have built a, a, a snow shack. It would have been interesting to, uh, to operate that way. But um, I'm the slacker of the month this month, but I, I did get a Raspberry Pi Pico, but I haven't taken it out of the anti-static bag, so... It's it's probably going to end up in the in the box of uh, incomplete dreams. <laughs> I've got too many other things started to be playing around with that right now. I ordered a couple of those myself, and one of them I have taken out of the anti-static bag to solder the pins on. But that's as far as I got with it because I wanted to see Tommy's segment first to see what my next step was. So we'll circle back Please. around. You'll be you'll be programming that thing tonight after you watch the segment. See how much fun it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. I'm wanting to program it in C, but I don't think that's going to be as easy as I would like it to be. Yeah, I discussed that a little bit in my segment, so I'll, I'll wait and you can see it. Okay. I don't want to spoil spoil all of it. There is a new version of the Rig Pi Two that just came out here recently and it it does a lot of nice upgrades to a rig pie howard nurse howard thanks for joining us tonight george i want to thank you very much for inviting me to be here tonight it's great to see you and tommy i think it's been a few years since uh we first met at mfj and uh must have been in the fall of about at least two years ago so Time flies. RigPi 2, as you say, was released uh, in November last year, and uh, the, it's available in a number of formats. You can buy the complete RigPi 2 unit from MFJ, which includes the audio board, the keyer board, and a, and a Raspberry Pi 4, or you can uh, download the image from MFJ uh, uh, in order to use uh, your existing rig Pi, or if you have a Raspberry Pi that doesn't have the case or uh, doesn't have the two boards, you can uh, save a lot of money and download the image, install it, and get all of the benefits of, of using rig Pi on your own Raspberry Pi. The main differences between the new version and the old version is that it uses the new Buster operating system. The Buster operating system is compatible with the Raspberry Pi 4 and uh, also the Raspberry Pi 3. The older version of um, RigPi uh, did not have uh, that uh, compatibility. You can't upgrade a Raspberry Pi 4 with uh, the old version of RigPi. It just won't run. But there have been over 30 new features added to the program and at least 20 new radios that are supported with the HamLib library of radio control. In this view, we have uh, the tuner window opened um, and it is very much like the older version except the, the buttons have been rearranged to give more room for the captions. 
You'll also see sliders, which is a big addition down at the bottom for audio gain, RF gain, uh, RF output power, and uh, it al allows you to, to very easily change the, uh, the various gains on the radio through sliders as opposed to having to create macros. There's an S meter in the middle of the top. The frequency uh, information is on the uh, left-hand side and the tuning knob is on the right-hand side. So this is a, um, um, as I say, it's not a whole lot different from the original version, but there's a lot that is going on behind the scenes. One of the big features that have been added is the ability to show your radio through a video camera. And this is especially important if you're operating out in the field, it lets you look back at your home station you can uh, aim the camera anywhere you want, or in this case, I'm, I have it uh, focused on my IC7300 visual display, and it is very handy in order to see in real time what's happening with the radio. You can see when you're going to transmit or if you change frequencies, you get instant confirmation of that just by looking at the video that's coming back into the tuner window. The rest of the windows are pretty much like they were before, let me just go over them really quickly. This is the CW window. So you can send and receive CW uh, through macros. One of the new additions to the RigPi is that you can also now send, in, send CW uh, through a remote key out in the field. Um, this can be done with another copy of RigPi running in the field, or you can use a, a free program called RigPi Hub that will run on a Windows laptop or Windows computer that lets you connect up a key and actually a key with a paddle or a bug or a straight key. There's a button on that uh, window also that you can let you, to, let you key with a, a, a mouse click if you want. That's a little bit awkward, but uh, the big thing is that uh, you can now uh, operate remote CW without having to use macros or a keyboard. Log window uh, hasn't been changed at all. The, uh, every time you log a contact, it appears in a list. You can set up different log books for different contests or different operators. Uh, you can also filter the log uh, based on uh, the time and date and uh, look at it in a number of different ways presented on the screen. This is the uh, DX spotter window, a spot show in the, in the list and uh, a frequency dial shows on the other side with uh, each of the spots uh, that let you click on the spots and tune the radio. The download is $29.95. And if you've purchased RigPi 1.05 since June of last year, uh, you can get a special price from MFJ of $5.95. If you have your own Raspberry Pi, a three or a four, and you want to brew your own, the cheapest way to do that is just by downloading the image, and that gives you all of the RigPi features. You said that you have been playing with uh, a Raspberry Pi and the new RigPi I have. Uh, software, George, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, actually, I have, and I just upgraded the, the RigPi version 1 that I had. Now, I know, of course, on a on a brand new Raspberry Pi 4, things are a bit peppier because I've, I'm using some 4s for other things. But let me say that everything I've tried so far on my original Rig Pi and the new version has worked. There, there have been no issues that I've encountered. Rig Pi version 2 is a major upgrade to both hardware and software. It runs on the Raspberry Pi 4, but what if you have one of the first generations? You can actually update the firmware on your RigPi. It's a pretty simple process. The first thing you're going to want to do is obtain the new firmware image. You can get that from mfjenterprises.com. It's available as a download or as an SD card. It's the MFJ1234BSD. The first thing we'll want to do is remove the case on the RigPi. And we'll want to remove the existing SD card, which is located right down here at the bottom. Now, to reach that, I'm just going to loosely use a pair of needle nose pliers there. And that's my original firmware. We'll hang on to that.
in case I ever decide I want it. We'll install the new card, and of course the pins go up against the motherboard. And that's all we physically have to do. The rest of this is all done in software. Since it is a brand new image, we'll be starting out like it's a brand new fresh Rig Pi 2. So we'll connect up our HDMI monitor and our power supply and a keyboard, and we'll set this one up. I'm going to use a USB keyboard, so I'll plug in a little dongle that goes with it right into the Rig Pi. And a free USB port. And we're going to set this one up using Wi Fi instead of the Ethernet cable. Wi Fi should be fast enough. I'll plug in my HDMI monitor so I can see what I'm doing and so you can see as well. And we'll plug in the power. And we are waiting on it to boot up. And there it is, running the Raspberry Pi Buster operating system. The next thing I'm going to do here is set up a username and a password that I prefer to use. Raspberry Pi configuration. The host name is going to be rigpi2.local. We'll want to remember that. One other thing I like to do is set up the VNC server. And I'm going to set me a static IP just because that's how I roll. To set up Mumble, I went to Configure and use the Certificate Wizard to create a new certificate. Using a certificate will help you avoid using passwords. You do want to back that up, though. Then I went to Server and Connect. And right here, I believe it had Pi. I right-clicked that, chose Edit, and entered my new username. Once I did that, I clicked on Connect. Now to set up RigPi, we'll double-click the RigPi icon on the desktop. And it will bring up a setup screen, actually a sign-on screen. The default user is named Admin, and the password is blank. You'll want to change that, but for right now, we'll just use that. You'll enter your call sign, username, then I'll enter a password. This is optional, but I certainly want to do that. I clicked fill below from call book, and it entered my first name, state, and my grid square. I could have entered a QRZ user and a QRZ password for XML access, but call book worked out fine. Then I'll click Next. Uh, radio manufacturer, well, I am using an ICOM. And I'll connect this to my 7700. I am using a serial port adapter on my Rig Pi since my radio is controllable either by a serial port or by TCP IP, which is not supported on the Raspberry Pi. And I'll click connect radio and let's see if it works and we're connected and that is the frequency the radio is set to next we are done and it was that simple very little i needed to do my radio of course is already connected to the rig pi all that is set up so basically all i needed to do was configure the new image here so if you've got a rig pi version one and you're considering upgrading to version 2? Why not? You'll get a ton of new features, and the upgrade is really simple. Here's one of the most visually pleasing upgrades for the RigPi version 2. If you plug in a USB camera and aim it at your rig, you can see the front panel of your rig. How cool is that? Well, I'll answer myself. That is very cool, Howard. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very Thank cool. Thank you. The uh, uh, it's amazing to watch you do that, George. You make it look so simple, and it isn't uh, that difficult for most users. It does take a little bit of computer knowledge, 
to uh, uh, really get rig pie going. And uh, but once you do, and once you've been through it once, it's uh, it's going to be easy that that second time. So thank you very much for doing that film. It was uh, it was excellent that video. So uh, yes, by all means, if you are using the old version of rig pie, uh, I strongly encourage you to upgrade to 2.0. It not only has uh, the 30 new features and and about 20 new radios. It has increased uh, uh, Im improved rotor support. It has uh, the ro remote CW. Um, it uh, allows you to use a little switch called a flick, a flick switch, which you can get on Amazon. And RigPi 2 supports that for push to talk. So to 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 go into transmit, you just push once. And to go back and to receive, you push it two times. So it's great if you're operating mobile and you are using a phone or a, a tablet in your car and you want to have easy push to talk, you can attach one of these to your, your uh, steering wheel and uh, just tap it once to go into transmit and tap it twice to go back and to receive. It also supports a, um, a wheel that uh, allows you to tune through any browser. So it's uh, a uh, toggle wheel, tog wheel that, uh, that uh, uh, looks just like a radio dial and uh, means that you don't have to use a keyboard to tune. And uh, that is also documented in, inside of Rig by Help. So uh, anyone that is interested in Rig Pi, be sure to check out the, the Rig Pi forum it's on uh, rigpi.groups.io. We have a very active group of participants, uh, over a thousand, uh, I think close to 1,300 uh, users on the forum now. So uh, you uh, can always ask for help and get many responses from people that have been able to solve problems and, and uh, get through it with a uh, get, uh, get you going and, and um, make it as easy as possible to get you up and running with your rig pie. Tommy? Yeah, I've got mine. I, I absolutely love mine. I use it a lot. Um, I travel a lot for my work, and I use it some when I travel, but I also find myself using some of the digital mode software that's already installed on there. Um, so I do, uh, if I'm busy at work, I'll run Whisper and just let it sit there and run, or I'll play around with FT8 or uh, PSK31 or whatever, and I just get a lot of use out of it. It's basically my ham radio computer for almost everything. Yeah, that's uh, that's great to hear, Tommy. I'm really glad you're in, enjoying it. Uh, and and it is true that uh, the RigPi uh, image comes with everything from email program to browser to mm -hmm. editing programs. Uh, so all the things that you would expect to find on a normal computer are available through RigPi. So you can just about do away with a laptop or a, a PC mm -hmm. in your in your shack uh, just by using RigPi. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I've done. That's pretty well dedicated for it. So anyway, really, really have enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, uh, the last field day right before all this uh, pandemic stuff hit, I actually went out and did uh, remote field day using it. I love to operate FT8 from our living room downstairs <laughs> and uh, you can you can go to a doctor's appointment and wait in the waiting room and and uh, uh, get a get a few cues on uh, FT8 uh, while you're while you're waiting for the doctor to show up so it, yeah, it makes absolutely. a lot of fun it's uh, it's been a really uh, pleasurable thing to have i've enjoyed it so much one of uh, the most uh, helpful users on the forum has a dad who i believe is 90 in his 90s and lives in a assisted living place where he can't put up an antenna. He lives, I think, 400 miles away. And uh, Steve, the, the user, says that his dad has just really loved getting on the air again. He can talk to his buddies and work the X from, from, uh, from his living facility, and it's just opened up a whole new world. So when I hear that kind of story, it just, just makes, makes things really, uh, it's really a happy story. I got to say, I was impressed in this version 2 upgrade how much stuff was added or improved upon. And you mentioned the sliders at the bottom of the tuner window there. That's the first thing I noticed and I look for 
Because I wanted that RF gain down there. And it's there now. And just really, it makes operating remotely so much more comfortable. I'm so much like being right there in front of the rig. It, it uh, very much does. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear your very positive response. And uh, I also have to say that without the aid of a number of beta testers and all of the folks participating on the forum, this project probably would never have gotten off the ground uh, uh, as far as it has. It's just been a pleasure to work with everyone and and get the great positive feedback and, and uh, look forward to things coming in the future. Hi, Howard. I, I know we haven't met, but I've heard a lot about you and uh, your, your huge project with uh, Rig Pi. But um, my question is, um, I can see this being really useful for uh, sight-impaired hams. And I'm just wondering if uh, maybe you could comment if you know of any, uh, you know, uh, visually challenged hams out there that are using Rig Pi to operate where they wouldn't be able to normally. Because as you know, the manufacturers are are making the radio smaller, and you know, the controllers are getting so so tiny uh, nowadays. Well, the uh, Rig Pi itself is doesn't have uh, text to speech built in, but since RigPi will run on any browser, uh, the text-to-speech uh, in that browser will work just w quite well to, to translate uh, the captions and uh, the buttons that you uh, have available. Um, I know I've, even on my iPhone, the uh, uh, text-to-speech uh, uh, assist works, works very well. The other uh, aspect of folks that aren't as uh, able to use their hands as everyone would like um, uh, is that uh, they've been able to uh, adapt to using RigPi as a way of controlling their radio. And, and uh, we have a couple of users, I think one in England, who um, is uh, impaired in his ability to use his hands. And it, he's now using RigPi um, quite successfully without with that uh, with that inherent problem. And another thing I really like about it, the the thing that really caught my notice right up front when you first showed us this project a few years back, aside from the tuner and the nice graphical interface and all you had there, is the fact that the interface is browser based. You don't have to install any special client or app or anything to operate it, you just pull up your web browser and run it. And I really like that because that means I can, I don't use an iPhone anymore. I've got an Android phone now. No problem. Runs right there on that. I can run it on my Windows computer. I can run it on my iPad. Just, you know, whatever browser you've got. So, that, to me, is a big plus in not requiring any software download on, you know, the uh, remote station that's going to be connecting in. It just works. Well, don't forget, though, that the audio part of the equation does require a download. And yeah. it's a free program called Mumble. And uh, the, the Mumble client is available for uh, Apple and Android and Windows uh, computers. So uh, it's uh, if you need two way audio, which you don't if you're going to be operating FT8, for example, yeah. um, but you do need to download Mumble and it's a free program you can get on the App Store or Google Play and uh, uh, it, it works quite well to connect in. Another aspect of the design that we haven't talked about is that it's multi user, which means you can actually set up uh, a number of radios on one RigPi, each having its own account. And you can set up different login cred credentials for each of those accounts. So a friend of yours can use a radio on your RigPi at the same time you're using a second radio on another account. So it's very much like a, a, a real server in that uh, it's, it is client-based and multi-user so uh, that means a number of people can use it 
simultaneously. And it's also, I'm noticing that a lot of clubs are installing it at remote locations so their club members can use the radio from, from their own homes as opposed to having a radio at their house. Uh, and the, the club supports the radio and runs RigPi and everybody can connect into it. So I think there are a lot of uses for this, some of which I haven't even heard about yet. Yeah, and one other thing I wanted to ask you about, and because I'm still running it on the uh, original Raspberry Pi 3B Plus I've got here, um, version 4 of the Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi 4B, how does that feel? I mean, did you decide, well, I'm going to add some new stuff in here now because we got a little extra horsepower on these newer generation machines? Well, that's a good question. I, I did add things that tax the CPU uh, more on the older Raspberry Pi than, than they do on the new one, things that you can actually turn off. For example, the video monitor uh, takes up some CPU uh, resources. So, uh, there are uh, good reasons to go with a Raspberry Pi in terms of speed and um, uh, the memory available. The, the Raspberry Pi 4 comes with a starting RAM of 2 gigabytes, which you can also get 4 and 8. And uh, it's a faster processor, so that uh, uh, means that the operation of RigPi will seem a little bit more seamless than it did on the Raspberry Pi 3. There will be a new 64-bit operating system coming along for the Raspberry Pi probably next year, and that will not run on the older Raspberry Pis as far as I know. So that's another reason to think about going with a Raspberry Pi 4. By the way, it will also, uh, RigPi will run just fine on the 400 keyboard that you talked about a couple of weeks ago. So if you have the new um, Raspberry Pi org uh, keyboard with a Raspberry Pi built in, you can use the 400 keyboard with a built in Raspberry Pi to run RigPi. Well, I was curious about that, and not that I'm I'm planning on putting it on uh, on my Pi 400. I like that just as a little desktop machine. I I I did get you know an I/O extender for it so that I could plug in some external hardware if I want to, but I think the original form factor uh, that you've got there with the stack on boards and all in the little case from MFJ is a good good form factor for the uh, for the rig pi but knowing that it runs on the 400 that's that's good to know too got my uh, upgrade card in recently so i'm looking forward to doing mine we've got some bad weather coming so i think that's going to be a good project for this coming weekend so anyway, I appreciate all the hard, hard work that you've put into it. And uh, again, I, I enjoy mine. I use it a lot. So anyway, I appreciate it. And appreciate you being on the show with us. It's good to see you again. And George, I think I saw a real quick question in the chat room, something about the um, the the flick switch he mentioned at the end there. I, yeah. if, he, if he has any uh, like link or information about that, somebody was asking, I believe. I don't have the specific link, but uh, if you go on Amazon, which is where I got mine, they have a pack of three switches for about, uh, I think it's about $80. So that's uh, another thing that the Flick company offers is a hub, which you don't need. You do need a cell phone. It runs on either um, iOS or Android. So that uh, acts as a a bridge between the Flick switch and uh, and RigPi. And uh, in addition to PTT, it's also programmed to turn power on and power off on the radio. And before I, I leave, I also want to be sure to thank Martin Jew at MFJ. Uh, he has been so receptive to this technology and encouraged me to to uh, uh, bring the product to MFJ, and uh, MFJ has been super in terms of uh, support and sales, and and uh, I can't thank Martin and the and Richard uh, and the gang at MFJ uh, enough. So uh, make it official. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Richard, Ben, and Engineering, and uh, all else, all the other folks there that have been making this product uh, available to to the world. 
Got to agree 100% there, Howard. There are uh, amateur radio devices and products we never would have seen were it not for Martin and the crew there at MFJ. So, and I'm glad to see y'all were able to partner and bring this product out on the market. So it's, I'm really pleased with it. I recommend it to anyone who wants to operate remote. It's just kind of like a no-brainer. It just, it just works. And uh, so many radios support it, too. So thanks for joining us tonight. It was really good to visit with you and catch up a little bit. And uh, let's do it again sometime soon. I'd love that, George and, and Tommy, and and uh, a great uh, meeting your other two hosts tonight. 7-3, Howard. Yeah, 7-3, Howard. Three. Yeah, bye-bye. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to upgrading mine. I've been kind of holding off. I knew you were going to do that, but if you didn't do it, I was saving mine to uh, – I might – I was – going to make a segment on it too but since you beat me to it now i'm gonna upgrade mine this weekend yeah it's really amazing how uh how far that project has progressed in such a you know relative short period of time there were so many upgrades to rig pie version two that in a, a two-minute ad i couldn't get them all in there they they wouldn't all fit introducing rig pie two the first major upgrade to the original MFJ-1234 or RigPi-1. Complete RigPi-2s come with pre-installed version 2.0 RigPi operating system using the latest Raspbian Buster operating system compatible with the Raspberry Pi 4B and 3B+. RigPi version 1 owners may upgrade their units by purchasing a micro SD card or download containing the version 2.0 RigPi operating system. New MFJ1234B RigPi 2 units include the latest Raspberry Pi Model 4B with 2GB of RAM and 32GB micro SD card. RigPi version 2 is jam-packed with features and comes with over 30 new features to excite the ham radio world. Here are just a few of the features of RigPi 2 OS. Remote CW keying over the internet. Support for over 27 new radios has been added. Control push-to-talk and frequency from a Contour Shuttle Express multimedia controller. Control PTT, power on-off, and relays with Flick Bluetooth remote switches. Support for changing antennas remotely with an Ameritron RCS-12 antenna switcher. Power amp control. For an added touch of functionality, connect a webcam to RigPi and watch your radio in the RigPi browser on your phone or tablet. On-screen sliders are included for adjusting AF gain, RF gain, power and mic level, and CW speed. Control 8 on-off devices or relays with macros using a special cable, and much, much more. If you've been looking for the perfect way to operate your station remotely, learn more about the new MFJ1234B RigPi version 2. Visit MFJEnterprises.com today. Brian Betts on our Amateur Logic Facebook forum uh, sent us in some pictures. Uh, the call sign is W7JET, Whiskey 7 Juliet Echo Tango. And he sent us some pictures from a uh, soda activation with uh, Red Summit RF Charlie NJ7V of Kentuck Mountain in Arizona. So, you know, we don't have too many mountains uh, down this way in the south. So yeah. it's always awesome for me to see that because uh, we're pretty much in the reverse of a mountain down here. So I love looking at these pictures. I really appreciate Brian uh, Betts sharing those with us. That's uh, good stuff and always great to see those in the Facebook forum. I had a mountain in my backyard last spring, but I hit it with the lawnmower and all the little ants went everywhere. <laughs> you know, same thing happened to mine. Um, uh, speaking of you, you might be the man, Tommy, I saw you were all, you were really pumped up and ready for it. Why don't we go I, ahead? I was psyched, man. I've been sitting here holding this piece of paper since we started. 
Well, why don't ready you, to read this. Yeah, why don't you read that? Okay, I will. This one's from somebody we know. You, you, know, you posted it over on the MeWe no. uh, group. Uh, anyway, it's about the uh, KA6 LMS special radio event that's coming up, uh, which we're all going to be a part of. Uh, the last man standing amateur radio clubs joining with a team of seasoned special event operators around the United States to present a multi-band, multi-mode special event celebrating the primetime network TV show for its positive and accurate portrayal of amateur radio. During its nine seasons, the last man standing amateur radio club operated as KA6 LMS from the real radios on the set during production breaks, making thousands of contacts with the show's amateur radio fans. If you're a fan of Tim Allen's TV series, Last Man Standing, you'll have a final chance to contact the show's amateur radio club station before it goes QRT. KA0XTT73. The week-long KA6 LMS radio special event starts on March 24th at 0000 UTC and runs through 2359 UTC on March 30th. This will be an all-mode, all-band event. CQ, CQ, CQ. This is KA6. KA6 LMS. LMS. This is Team Alpha 6. This is Team Alpha 6. This is Team Alpha 6. Sierra calling CQ, CQ. Fans will have the opportunity to work the bonus one-by-one stations. K6L, K6M, K6S, W6L, W6M, and W6S. Stations from every call sign area will operate as KA6LMS-0 through KA6LMS-9 and KA6LMS-VE, providing nationwide and international coverage. The remote operators are a virtual who's who of ham celebrities, contesters, and podcasters. Many will live stream their operations. Check spotting sites like DX Summit for pop-up operations on any day and at any time during the event week. We expect the on-stage radios to be in operation from the studio in California on Saturday, March 27th at 1800 UTC using 20 meters and on Sunday at 2200 UTC using 40 meters. If you're a fan of digital modes, Saturday, March 27th is your day. At 1700 UTC, KA6 LMS will be using D Star on Reflector 12 Alpha, hosted by the PAPA repeater system. At 1900 UTC, the D Star action moves to Reflector 30 Bravo, hosted by Georgia D Star. At 2300 UTC, AmateurLogic.tv will host the KA6 LMS multi mode QSO party using All Star, DMR, D Star. NXDN, P25, Echo Link, Hamshack Hotline, Wires X, and Yesu System Fusion. KA6 LMS QSL cards will be available for stations who contact the stage directly or through relay stations. Special event certificates, including clean sweep endorsements, will be available via download. The KA6 LMS radio event is sponsored by the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club's 12 Days of Christmas team and K2 Heroes teams. In association with AmateurLogic.tv, the PAPA repeater system, and Georgia D-Star. And of course, Last Man Standing and KA6 LMS have always been powered by ICOM. For more information, go to www.gsbarc.org slash LMS slash. And we are going to be having an Amateur Logic K6 LMS QSO party, but the Amateur Logic Soundcheck Net. We're planning on operating that Saturday. I believe it's the 27th from 6 p.m. Central Time to until about midnight, or whenever the contacts happen to run out, or whatever. But uh, and we'll be live streaming a good portion of that as well, if not all of it. So stay tuned for that. It should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Things are getting smaller. In the pie world, and I think you're the guy. E e email, correct me if I'm wrong. Pies do get smaller, don't they? P wait, pies? Yes. Yeah, as you eat them, yes. Okay. There you go. Why don't you set up tonight's segment? Okay. Well, uh, 
Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, released a, a little microcontroller. I say little, it is little, uh, to kind of compete with some of the Arduino controllers. Uh, looks a lot like the big giant when Mike's got behind his head right there. So anyway, I got a little first look at that. So let's take a look at it. Here at AmateurLogic.tv, if you've been watching for a while, you know we love microcontrollers, Arduinos, and things like that. I've done quite a few projects myself with an Arduino Uno. Uh, recently, I've been doing quite a few things with an Arduino Pro Mini. This is a clone I picked up at Micro Center. And now, recently, Raspberry Pi has come out with a competitor. It's called a Raspberry Pi Pico. It's a little bit larger than the Pro Mini, as you can see, but not by much. It's a good size and there's a lot of capability. Let's take a look at a comparison of the ones that I have. The Pro Mini and the Uno have similar processors, the AT Mega or AT Mega 328 and the 328P, but the Raspberry Pi Pico has got a new chip designed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. It's a dual core ARM chip, which I'm thinking is probably a derivative of the one they used for the Raspberry Pi W or Zero W. It's got 264K of RAM on the chip, 2 megs of flash, 26 multifunction GPIO pins, 3 or analog inputs, 2 UARTs. It's got 2 I2C controllers where if you look at the other two they only have one. The Raspberry Pi Pico is a USB 1.1 controller. It's got a host and is acts as a device. Uh, it's got 8 programmable I.O. pins. It has a built-in temperature sensor and an accurate on-chip clock. And we'll play around with some of that stuff in the future. It's also got an accelerated floating point library built onto the device. So math functions should be pretty fast. I don't know if you older guys like myself remember in the early computer days you actually had to buy an 8087 I believe it was math coprocessor chip if you wanted to do floating point math to speed things up a lot it really made a big difference but you can compare them and take a look in uh, the Pi Pico is a little bit more robust than the others to get started we need a micro USB cable that's a data cable like we've talked about in the past let's go ahead and hold down this button right here and plug it in and that's going to put it in storage mode as we see on our computer it opened up like a USB drive. Now let, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Properties. It's got uh, 127 megs of free space. So this is 128 megs they were talking about. Let's go ahead and look at the index. It takes us to the Raspberry Pi Pico getting started page. From here, we can look at the getting started stuff. We can see the specs. Get started with C++ or MicroPython. C or C++ rather is going to be a lot more familiar to you if you're used to doing Arduino programming. It's, it's going to be different, but it's, the syntax is similar. And MicroPython is good if you want a, a fast, lightweight, uh, interpreted language. And I think I'm going to go with the MicroPython just, just for fun, just to do something a little bit different. So let's get started with that. We're going to need to put MicroPython on the device. By default, it runs C code, compiled C code but we need to put this MicroPython interpreter on. So let's download that. And I'll just drop it on my desktop here. And let's go ahead and, here it is. Let's go ahead and drag it over into our device. Once it gets in, it's gonna reboot the device all on its own. And when it comes up, it's gonna be running MicroPython. At this point, you can unplug it and hold the button down, put it back in, and get back to that storage mode, or we can go ahead and program with the thing. Let's take a look at some sample code at the differences between MicroPython and the Arduino IDE. I've pulled up the sample blink program. This is an ultra simple program, and at one point I said I wasn't gonna do any more blinky LED programs, but I guess I lied. In the setup function, we set up a pin it's just going to use the built-in LED that's on the device. We're setting it up as an output, and we're going to do the normal program loop. We're going to write to the LED pin, which is, this is a constant for pin number 13. We're going to set it high, which will turn it on. We're going to wait one second, or 1,000 milliseconds. 
and then we're going to turn it off, wait a thousand milliseconds, and we're going to do it again and just do this for eternity. So we're going to have one second on, one second off. Now the equivalent code for MicroPython, this is a little one I put together. And if you take a look at them side by side, you can see they're not that different. Here we're going to import the time library, import from the machine library, we're going to bring in the pin object. And here we're going to set a variable called LED. It's part of it's a instantiation of the pin object. We're going to use pin 25, which is the built-in LED on the board. It's not on by default like the others are, by the way. And let's do a loop. So while true, we're going to toggle the LED and we're going to sleep for two seconds. Well, actually, we can do one second so it'll be the same as the other. And it'll just do the same thing over and over again. And be on one second, off one second. To do that, we need to get the code onto the Pico. But if we're going to use uh, MicroPython, we need the MicroPython editor and a way to get the code onto it. I'm going to use the Thani uh, IDE. We can download it from Thani.org. The URL's on your screen. And let's go ahead and download the Windows version. Incidentally, you want to have the at least version 3.3.3 because it has support for the Raspberry Pi Pico device built in. Otherwise, you're going to need to download an extension and put it on. While that's installing, now I'm a, I'm a software developer by trade. That's my normal day-to-day -day job, and I stay in Visual Studio a lot, the Microsoft IDE. And this, you can actually use... Microsoft Visual Studio Code and some other stuff to develop for this, but there are a lot of prerequisites that you're going to have to download and install on your computer. And we may do another video on that in the future, but it's uh, quite extensive. So it's successful. Let's go ahead and run it. English and the standard settings. We're going to need to go in into the settings, tools, and options. And we're going to need to pick an interpreter. Now we're going to use the MicroPython for the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is why you need the 3.3.3 version. This has support for that one. Now the port, we can try to detect it automatically or we can do pick it. Now, I, I know this is going to be COM3 on this computer, so I'm going to go ahead and just pick that one. And we've got the prompt down here. Let's go ahead and take this code so I don't just have to bore you with typing it in. And I'll take that and I'll paste it in here. This is where you would normally write your programs or load them up or whatever. And if we hit run, let's do that. And let's watch the Pi. Uh, I keep wanting to call it a Raspberry Pi. Let's watch this Pico and run it. And I want to run it on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Oh, I need to save it. We'll call it uh, my blink dot. Uh, PY for Python and it went. Now you can see the device is blinking one on one second off one second from the code we did. That was easy to set up Windows but since Raspberry Pi actually made the device we can take this device and plug it in to our Raspberry Pi over here and do the exact same thing. Let's, let's go ahead and remote to it. If we look in here under programming, the same IDE is already loaded up. And we can go into tools and options, interpreter, pick the exact same things, pick the pick the port again and do and do the same thing. We don't really have to install anything. Now, there's an extra step we need to do. Normally you would write programs for these little microcontrollers and and then this thing just does its job. You don't need a computer anymore or otherwise it'd be kind of silly. But you can unplug it, have all your components hooked up to it or whatever you're going to control or, or use this device for. And then you can take it off and it does its job on its own with a power source. So here to make it persist, we need to do one extra step. So on our little program, we just go File, Save As. We need to pick... Raspberry Pi Pico this time 
and it's got to be called main.py. That's the program that runs by default. So let's call it main.py. I'll click save. Yes. And it's on there. I closed the IDE. And it's sitting there running by itself. And if I hook this up to nothing but a battery, you can see that it's doing its job. This is just a quick getting started guide how to use MicroPython, set up your Raspberry Pi Pico, and what you would need to do to persist your program so it runs on there without being tethered to a computer. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to doing some more projects with this little device in the future. 73. Well, Tommy, since you were using the uh, MicroPython there, I think I'm going to have to go back and watch that a second time because I just... I'm not a Python developer. Or you don't have to be. If you if you can use one language, you can use pretty much any of them if you don't mind looking up a little bit of syntax, a few the keywords and things like that. Um, it was it was really easy. If you look at go back and watch it and look at the code, it's so simple. Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, because um, I'll probably do one on setting up uh, C sometime in the future. Uh, but it's it's quite involved to set it up to use some of the Microsoft tools like like we would normally use. Um, but uh, I mean, it could be done, but you've got to download a lot of prerequisites before you can use it. Yeah, well, uh, that's the one I want to see. You want to see C? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't care necessarily if it's a Microsoft. Um, you know, Visual Studio Code, or if it's uh, you know some Linux code editor. Well, you like typically the people write it using uh, um, Visual Studio Code. You know that uh, the editor mm -hmm. it's got all the plugins. It's really nice. I use it for a lot of things, and then you compile it using the GCC. Yeah. Well, my device. I'm glad to see one of us did something with it. And, I couldn't yeah. hardly wait for when I got mine. I would. I'm like like you guys. I went over there and opened the uh, the uh, anti-static bag right away and started messing around with it. Yeah, I don't have the patience. I had I had to tear in. Well, I had too many other things going on to tear into it, and I knew you were going to. So I said, "Hey, you know, I'll look over Tommy's shoulder when he does his and give me a head start." Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hooking up some peripherals, my little I square C display, and some things like that, and, and figuring that part out too, because the pinouts are kind of different on it than the Arduino's. Yeah, it's similar, but it's it's still a little bit different. Yeah, and it's not I, really. I think it's really. I think it's really cool. They put a real time clock in this one. Uh huh. Yeah, I hope they'll um, they'll they'll do some coding to allow you to use the uh, Arduino IDE with it at some point. I know Adafruit's got a device that's based on that same chip, more or less. That, that yeah, does. the Trinket. I've yeah. got one of those. Yeah. But anyway. I've, I've seen a video real quick, George, where they uh, added a button to it so you didn't have to pull that power cable out to reset it, too. Yeah. Hey, there's an idea. Yep. Hmm, you'll feel like you're using a Pi 400. Is that what you're saying? Or uh, <laughs> the, uh, what is it? It, it kind of makes it like the um, Micro Python boards, controllers. Oh. But you have a re the reset button and it puts it in the storage, mass storage mode. Uh, somebody added a button to it, found, found the pins where you could reset it, basically. So I have yeah. to send you that link. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. For four dollars and and the capability that things got, you can't hardly beat it. It's kind of worth a little bit of learning curve if you got something pretty substantial that you want to to build. Yeah, well, and being a dual core, you know, as mm -hmm. as well, you know, that's a whole another level there. If you really want to dig uh -huh. in and work that hard, you can do some. Yeah, I need, I'm a, I need to look into that some too. Yeah, I think you got to do a little custom programming to take advantage of it. From what I've seen so far initially well but that's a 
I had an email that came to me this week uh, from one of my friends, K0UPW, Jim, here in uh, the Jackson, Mississippi area. And he wanted to alert us to a tea hunt coming up. And I had heard these groups, well, th this particular group of guys, talking maybe once or twice. I didn't know that uh, they were doing it on this level yet. But there's one coming up next weekend, February 20th. It's going to be, well, they're going to do it mobile. And you'll be able to drive around and do your transmit hunt and all the the transmitter is going to be hidden within 20 feet of wherever you might be in your vehicle so you won't have to walk way far out in the woods to get to it uh they're going to have assistance on the pilahatchee repeater here 145.39 with a 77 hertz tone. That's one of W5PPB's repeaters. And it's going to be in and around Morton, Mississippi, where the tea hunt will be occurring this time. It's only going to be uh, 15 milliwatts. So you're going to need to listen pretty hard. And the hidden transmitter is going to be on 145.565 simplex. If you'd like to learn more about that, well, we've got a place right here that you can go. It is msrdf.com. And there you'll get the details as well as some future ones coming up. Details on the group. And like I say, I didn't realize that this had taken off quite like it had. They've been growing this pretty good. They've got a lot of things, the different tea hunts scheduled for this year. Of course, this one in February, they got one scheduled for March, April, May, June, and they're working on some others as well. So, sounds like a fun activity to me, Tommy. I think you have to get in on some of this. I'd be interested to ride out there and check it out. I didn't know that was going on around here. I had no idea. I'd probably have already been out there in the past. Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bookmark that website and kind of keep up with it. If I don't have anything going on, I might actually ride by that way next weekend and take a look. I might too. I've been thinking about it. It uh, sounds yeah, like I, I'm. I'm thinking, George, that the water is running downhill because we we have a uh, a ham here that lives near uh, Glenn and I, who actually started a GNO amateur radio direction finding group, and I think their first event is tomorrow. Oh wow! <laughs> so it must be something in the water. We must have got some of the runoff from, from you guys. Well, maybe so. Well, um, hopefully it's going to be a little warmer next week. So yeah. it's going to be cold tomorrow, let me just say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment because, hey, you know, we're not done yet. It's still winter time, and email's got something that he wants to talk about. So don't go away. Love is on the air at ICOM. This sweetheart of a package with the IC705 is the perfect sidekick for hams that like to enjoy what both the great indoors and outdoors have to offer. It's the perfect QRP companion, base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds, RF direct sampling for most of the HF band, IF sampling for frequencies above 25 MHz. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the now available optional LC192 backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or a day in the park. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall, 5 watts with the BP272 battery pack, or 10 watts with external 13.8 volt DC, single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D Star functions, micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card slot. 
HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the now available optional LC192 backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or a day in the park. Other available accessories include the AL705 QRP portable magnetic antenna, BP272 standard battery pack, or BP307 lithium ion battery pack, micro USB to micro USB cable, USB type C to micro USB cable, DC power cable, compact lapel PTT microphone with earphone, MBF705 desktop tray. And coming soon, the AH705 antenna tuner. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Speaking of ICOM and MFJ, like we've been talking about in some of our segments today, I, I think I have another uh, ICOM and MFJ loaded video here um, <laughs> about our winter field day. For the W5 SLA club that, uh, like I said earlier, KG5CEN Glenn in the chat room and I went and uh, worked at a local hams uh, farm in the field. And we got a little bit uh, tactical this go around. Check it out. Can't play feet. Got to go to field day. Hello, George, Tommy, Mike, Amateur Logic TV viewers. In this episode of Cheap Old Man Minutes, I wanted to show you the W5 SLA Ozone Amateur Radio Club's 2021 Winter Field Day events with a little bit of a twist this year. We had tactically deployed and used our DigiPeter along with the Winlink systems out in the field, just as a demonstration along with the normal we, uh, field day activities as well. Speaking of normal operations and activities for winter field day, normal for us is not quite the same normal for other people in winter time down here. So we had a, a relatively pleasant day, I'm sure, compared to most. But uh, with the, here is us operating in our different stations. We are actually operating three stations for the W5 SLA, three Oscar Lima Alpha station here. So the, yeah, normal for us is not, not quite the same as others, but uh, we did have quite a bit of wind on this day. Here you can see our HF stations with various antennas and masts. Looks like it's an all MFJ and ICOM HF uh, station here for field day. That was uh, quite interesting and very functional as well. So you remember I mentioned a twist. So here's the twist. This time I decided to deploy my uh, RMS packet gateway, the KE5QKR-10, the uh, packet gateway we use to transfer mail and other data between our stations here using our packet DigiPeter from the club. And here is a picture of that station deployed out there on battery using the uh, HF and I'm sorry, the VHF antenna 
on the standard 145.010 frequency for packet. So yeah, this, this station here, uh, we actually used to receive a message from another ham in within our parish slash counties everywhere else. Uh, and then replied, you'll see a little bit later via another method. While the other station was a VHF server, if you will, or one of their RMS packet gateways, this one is the HF client side. We didn't uh, serve anything via HF from the field, but we did uh, connect with other stations and send messages. So the HF Winlink station in this case was used or deployed in the field as well. So first I'll start with a description of what we did here. Uh, AA5UI, another ham in our parish, uh, sent a message to our station in the field, which was field deployed. It's a gateway. And that basically traversed our club's digipeter, which gives us coverage around the entire area here. So in looking at it, you had a message originate from a, another ham within our parish, which went over to the W5SLA-4 digipeter, FM uh, uh, AX.25 packet, and then from there went to our station where we were deployed up here in the uh, Covington area. And so in, in part, there's this is the method we use to tactically communicate with each other, the hams within an affected area, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, via our own digi, if not peer-to-peer -peer or other methods. Our club spends quite a bit of time and effort, monies to maintain the infrastructure that's required to uh, make this work. So I figured I'd demonstrate and show you how, how we're doing it. It's one thing to be able to send messages from ham to ham via a digi in a, an affected area like that. This is our worst case scenario, which we've been through before. And it's, but the, the other case would be, how are we gonna get this message out of that affected area if all of our infrastructure is down, not working? Uh, and the answer is the other part of this station that we deployed was the HF wind link part of the um, equation. So in this case, we have deployed in this inside the affected area that HF wind link station. And from there, we can basically take that email and send it out of the area. In this case, we hit a station in, uh, I think it was Gainesville, Florida, or around that area. And his station, of course, did have infrastructure and connectivity, which basically sent it up to Winlink's AWS cloud presence and the internet. Um, while that's just one scenario, it's a good demonstration of how you can use the combination of the two to tactically work within the affected area via VHF or UHF, and then how you might have to send things outside of that, depending on how widespread the infrastructure is damaged or not working. One of the greatest assets that I've always touted is that of the Winlink system is that it's a robust system of in a network of people, hams, us, uh, who volunteer who basically self-police or self and use it for lawful purposes like health and welfare traffic or standard traffic uh, serving maybe an organization who needs help communicating. Uh, it's flexible, it's capable. As you see now, it's, it's deployable. Um, and most importantly, it's supported. People still develop this system to this day. There's new protocols, there's multiple protocols, multiple paths for communication. So 
you some if you want if you're willing you find a way to make this work for you some might be asking well what or how can you do what with with this software and the system uh, besides sending internet emails um, you can also do peer-to-peer uh, -peer connectivity as well you don't have to have internet access uh, access to to make this system work if it's there great if it's not then you still have options um, there are multiple protocols one of the biggest multiple methods and multiple protocols one of the biggest access to me of this system uh, that can be used uh, even lately I've seen on the menus they have uh, satellite communication via the Iridium go system so texting basically uh, you can send GPS position reports, um, which is a great thing to have if you're you got somebody looking out for you or uh, trying to figure out where you were last heard or seen. Um, you have the standard state or agency, uh, state or federal agency forms, the ICS system, Incident Command System forms that we all have used probably to send traffic for another organization to uh, serve them uh, the there's also a, a category or a catalog within their system where you can get news and other bulletins and weather information propagation information bunch of stuff here that's all requestable you send an email out via their catalog query requests and you connect the next time you connect you're going to get this bulletin in your inbox of what the information you were looking for. I think that's pretty cool, pretty neat. Since the system is still supported and developed by WinLink volunteers, uh, there is uh, more information at the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, Inc., as well as the uh, WinLink uh, contacts here in Lynx. Um, lots of people still supporting this thing, lots of communications forums talking about what's what's happening and what it's used for so lots more information out there <laughs>
rig pie back here and uh, just get on the radio a little bit uh, since the weather's kind of bad. It's cold. Uh, I know Jeff was in the chat room there, uh, K0 um, uh, JSC. Um, him and, and, and Amanda, K1DDN, will be our uh, net controllers uh, for uh, Tuesday night's net. And one thing I want to mention, you know, these are not like uh, 15 or 20 minute nets. Uh, you know, the net starts at 8 p.m. Central on Tuesday nights. If you forget about it and don't think about it till 9 p.m., or 10 p.m., you're probably still okay because the net's yep. still going to be going. And also, there's some other things that are going on on the same night. We, we That was the only slot we could get, so I know it's a conflict. I think uh, Tom uh, has something going to his video stream, but this net lasts quite a few hours, so it's a good chance that uh, you pop over there and, and have time to check in if, if you visit that as well, so... Yeah. Uh, email, any final thoughts? Well, uh, I guess I'm going to have to join the uh, the Mike Club, or uh, as Marty's calling it in the chat room right now, the International Club for Incomplete Dreamer Drawer Owners, and <laughs> reach into my incomplete drawer and, and finish that project I started with the Lightning Pie. Now that Winter Field Day is behind us, so I got some work to do on that thing. Why well, put it off today when you can put it off till tomorrow? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> Marty, you, you and Marty, I think you got the market cornered on that, but uh, it looks like he's wanting to start a club. I guess I'll mention since it's kind of cold weather across most of the U.S. today, if you're going to go outside, you probably want to wear a shirt. And you can find some shop dot spreadshirt dot com slash amateur logic as a matter of fact you can find a lot of them there and a coffee mug to put your coffee your hot tea or your hot chocolate into there's actually uh some jackets on there too and sweatshirts so if it's cold enough you could probably wear one of each at the same time yep oh wow Let's and a cap and I just took my mug to the other side of the room when I went and disabled that screensaver, so I don't have it sitting right here for product placement. Oh, dude, dude, I do not know you for wearing that hat backwards. We're going to have to get it printed on both sides like those ICOM T-shirts, Tommy. Yep. And let's see, was there anything else? Well... We'd like you to join us on our social media outlets throughout the month. There's a number of them there that you can do that at. Uh, Facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv. Uh, I missed the cue, didn't I? Yeah. We're on uh, Twitter. At, ow, ouch. <laughs> Wrong side. <laughs> We're on Twitter at Amateur Logic. Let me finish. Out. Or, ooh, ah, uh, <laughs> or the um, the thing that's covered with the George Thomas logo on my screen, <laughs> or the MeWe. Me we. Okay, I see it. MeWe. dot com. <laughs> I can't see the the middle part, and I'm yeah. I'll, I'll help you. MeWe. dot okay. com join slash join slash amateur logic TV. Or, or groups. Dot io slash g slash amateur logic we may have another one to add at some point we're doing a little experimenting with yeah we'll have to see okay and the show notes what would a show be without notes i i keep plenty of them around here you know just you never know we even have the of, invisible. Yeah, we don't want a noteless show. You know, <laughs> if you go get your eyes tested, you're going to need one of these right here when you go outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually yellow, but. Uh, oh, well. Uh, anyway. Anyway, they're at amateurlogic.tv forward slash wiki. Okay. 
And we will see you back here at the end of the month for Ham College, the next episode. And I think we will actually, Dean Martin will be back with us. Although yep. the last one was generally cheap and it was, it was good, you know, worked out really good. <laughs> yeah, looks like you had generally had fun too. We did. We did. And it was I cheap. Think I'll be, I think I'll be on a Dean's list this year. I came college. I think, yeah. Uh, do we have to salute you? <laughs> generally, <laughs> generally, yes. <laughs> All right. Seven three. Yeah, seven three. Everybody. Seven three. How about if we do an email? You know, I think that's a most excellent idea. And I know a guy who just happens to have the well, f- the first email might, of the night. I might be that guy. No. Mine's better. You're not. <laughs> Here, and I think you should have a few more pictures there, eh, George? <gasps> I should, but I don't.